When I wrote this poem, I never planned on sharing it. The only reason I ever shared it was because myself, as a first wave scholar, was with another first wave scholar in my cohort, and he convinced me to have a session where we shared poems we never shared. So two years after it was written was the first time I said it out loud. And he convinced me to keep saying it out loud. So I ask you all to close your eyes and take a moment to envision someone or something that has ever tried to make you feel small or not good enough or not smart enough or not capable enough, not powerful enough. And I dedicate this poem to them. You will not waste me. You will not fold me. Hide me in your back pocket. You will not lose me in the bottom of your laundry basket. You will not fade my design, dim my bright, turn my shine into your shadow. You will not excuse me. You will not draw my figure. You will not figure me out. You will not wrap me in your self-made cellophane ego. You will not suffocate me. I will see through you. You will not confuse me for your pet. You will not pet me like your dog. You will not dog me like we're boys. You will not be boy at your age. You will not drown me in the tide of your temper. You will not outclap my thunder. You will not strike me. You are not lightning. You are not likely to outright swipe me. You will not crack my stone stair. You will not break my glass hearts. You will not carve my calluses smooth or hack my smoothness course. You will not crash into my drive. You will not ride my success without my permission. I will not be written off as too angry, too feminist, too victim. You will not diminish the light that brought your sinking ship to shore. I stand too tall. You will not swim through me. I will not swallow my wide. You will not wade my coast with dirty feet. You will not pollute me. You will not use me as your clean slate to stain me with your repeated mistake. You will not mistake my kindness as being blinded. I will see through you. You will not drain my flame to flicker. You will not dilute my message. I will not water this down. You will not treat me like the child inside you. Abuse me like I did what's been done to you, what he did to your mother, what you do to yourself, what she did to your self-esteem, or whatever excuse you use to use me. You will love me with every ounce of your weight, or you will leave me with my queendom in full bloom, and whether you wither or grow in your own time, you will not waste me. That is Sophia Snow. Let's give it up for her one more time. Sophia is the 2014 Madison Magazine uh, Millennial to Look Out For, so just look out for that young sister. Uh, she's amazing, and she's also a member of the first cohort of the First Wave Hip Hop and Urban Learning Community, which is the first scholarship of its kind that we know uh, of in the planet. And also, she's the education coordinator for the Office of Multicultural Arts Initiatives, which houses First Wave at the UW Madison. Sophia is one uh, of thousands of young spoken word and hip hop artists uh, that are in our communities. And the presentation that I'm gonna make very shortly is the fact is there's a community of amazing artists and leaders that are largely invisibilized in our communities. They're right before us. They're in our neighborhood centers. They're in our schools. Uh, they're the leaders. They're not invisible to their peers. They're not invisible to their churches. They're not invisible to their communities. They're invisible to the high arts. Those communities that have excluded them. The elite artists uh, that don't, want, don't believe that hip-hop culture has value of integrity. Uh, and also they become invisibilized highly in higher education. Uh, they've not been integrated effectively. And the University of Wisconsin has made a commitment and taken a risk, what they felt was a risk, on integrating this young population 
into its confines, being the first ever university to do so on this planet. And the thing is, is that you can tell right now that I'm not a spoken word artist. Uh, but I'm so far behind the curve that four of my first wave students have already done TED Talks. <laughs> From Hawaii to Baton Rouge to the Bay, and just recently in Istanbul, Turkey. So just say I'm following those, those youth. But the feeling you just had with Sophia Snow, if it was the first time that you had seen or heard spoken word, some of you may have, may not. But just imagine yourself in my shoes in 2003. I was in a school gymnasium in West High School. A friend of mine, John Santos, who's a famous Latin jazz star from the Bay Area, called me and said, you've got to check out this spoken word shit, brother. It is the hottest thing that's happening. And I hadn't seen spoken word since Gil Scott Heron. A little, about, a little bit outdated. And he said, just bring some of these artists and you'll be changed forever. So here I am with four poets, Tammy Gomez from Texas, Mani Posa from the Bronx, Marco Muthi Joseph and Paul Flores from the Bay Area. There are four different corners of West High School, school Gym. There's 2,200 students. It's the first all-school cultural assembly they had in 20 years. And Lauren Rath, the former principal, had, invite, I had invited us to take this risk with him on this journey for four poets to stand in corners of a gym doing poetry to young teenagers. Pandemonium, pandemonium could have broken out. But what happened was this electrified, amazing experience which blew the top off of that school. So we took the same group of four poets over to East High School. And uh, they did their performance. It was staggering. They felt the way you're probably feeling right now after so so Sophia's poem. And afterward, there was a workshop. There was supposed to be about 25 students. And 125 students insisted to be there for more poetry. And, and so uh, one of the poets, Paul Flora, said, um, do any of y'all write poetry, or haikus, or anything? Uh, and they all started, one by one, taking out their backpacks, spiral notebooks, and writing pads, and journals, and sharing their stories, their poetry, none of which that they're doing in their English classes. Only amongst themselves, or individually, in their homes, in their rooms. And there's a the personal narratives. Everything that David was just talking about, the whole idea of stories. Their own stories that were not being talked about in their classrooms. And I remember that there was this young paraplegic white boy that was sitting in the front of the auditorium. And he was started, he got so excited by the sharing experience that he started freestyling poetry and raps. And the group, a multicultural group of kids came around him and started beatboxing and freestyling and giving him so much love and support. And that's the germ, the beginning of First Wave. That moment, that magical moment. So six weeks later, I get called by a man named Jim, James uh, Cass, who is the founder of an organization called You Speaks in the Bay Area, actually an alum from UW Madison. And he said, Willie, there's some hot shit happening in Madison, isn't there? And I said, well, it's pretty exciting what's going on. He goes, well, I just heard from my two leaders of my arts community, Margo Muthi Joseph and Paul Flores, that that was some of the most amazing things they've ever seen in their lives as poets. So he goes, I'll make you a deal. You get six young poets, teen slam poets, and I'll pay for them to go to Los Angeles for the 2004 Brave New Voices International Poetry Festival. And so we went about having, uh, doing small poetry slams around the Madison area. I think you can all hear me, right? Yeah. We're all good. So I don't even need this. Uh, and so we went around, got six poets that actually rep represent all high schools, went to Los Angeles, uh, to this 2004 competition, and there, there I saw it, I had the witness of the mecca of youth culture. Youth culture of the, the, communities of the communities of color that did not participate in musical theater, not in forensics, not in debate, but were doing poetry through the spoken word. 300 at the time from 25 different cities, and the semifinals were in Watts, and the finals were at the Ricardo Montalban Theater. And I, it was just an amazing, transformative experience for an old man like me who had been around the world or in the a block once or twice. And so uh, the next year I brought another team uh, to San Francisco to the 2005 slam, slam finals in uh, San Francisco. The same thing happened. And what struck me was just the, the genius, the lyricism, 
but most, in, as importantly, is the fact that no one from higher education was tapping into this network, this gold mine, genius that's just right before us in all of our communities. And so about two months later, I got a call from the chief, diversity, the chief uh, financial officer from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Darrell Bissell. And he called me into his palatial office, which is the first door to the right when you go into Bascom Hill, <laughs> Bascom Hall. And he just, he had heard through the grapevine, because at that time he was the head of 100 Black Men of Madison, and he said, we heard something's up with this, all the networks, with the teachers and the students and the parents. Uh, and he goes, let me, let me know what's happened. And I basically said, I said, you know, I've been around the block a few times, and I've been around the world, and I've been saying that whatever institution taps into this gold mine of talent is going to be in the cutting edge of higher education for the 21st century. And he goes, I believe you. He goes, he goes, what do you want? And I say, I want scholarships. I want you all to invest money in these students. Uh, and he goes, OK. Things happen fast when you work with the CFO of the university. I don't think it happens fast else at any other time. So by the fall of 2005, my office was open, the Office of Multicultural Arts Initiatives, the first hip hop arts program in higher education. Uh, but most importantly, we initiated the first wave program and started to recruit for our first cohort that Sophia was part of. And the first hire was Josh Healy, a Jewish poet, leader, amazing activist. And we started to go search for those 15. And along the ride, we joined, we're joined with Chris Walker, who was artistic, artistic director. Some of you may know him. He's in the dance department. And the rest you can say in a certain way is history. In that short time since that first group came in, in the fall of two, uh, summer of 2007, uh, we're now uh, uh, getting ready to have our eighth cohort arrive on campus uh, in about two weeks. And since that time, we've won both the Wisconsin Governor's Arts Award, the first arts program in the state of Wisconsin from a university to ever win that award, including the National Governor's Arts Award. But more importantly, the statistics of our student success is, is amazing. 95% retention and graduation rates. Our students, all who have applied to graduate school, have got full funding. They're moving into the jobs in the nonprofit sector. Uh, we have one of our students at the Harlem Children's Zone as one of the leaders there, and she's the one who actually gave the lecture in uh, Istanbul recently for the TED Talks. Uh, and so basically, we've created a cadre of amazing young leaders who've been successful. And beyond the, the, the academic side for the students, it's transformed the way that a lot of our professors are teaching and approaching teaching. Um, I have an article in the lobby by Gloria Lansing Billings, an international, ed international education leader from the School of Education who had half of her students uh, who, were part, who were first wave students that she, she uh, developed a hip hop studies class. And this is after 30 years teaching, she organized a course on hip hop. Uh, and she had 15 students and basically she created, it's almost like a new paradigm which she's creating about a culturally sustainable pedagogy when you have a core of these young creative minds that come together and use performance as a vehicle for educational transformation. And it's an amazing article uh, that she wrote and very transformative. And she's now one of our international spokespeople. She's going around the world at conferences talking about first wave and all the like. And, and what's interesting, what's happened in, in addition to the, you know, us having an international touring company called the First Wave Hip Hop Touring Ensemble, and we perform at the NCA National Convention just recently, and the National Conference of Teachers of English, the National Boys and Girls Club Keystone Conference. Uh, but what I was, people always ask, what is, what is the parallel? You know, it's, you know, what has happened similar to this? And there's nothing like it, but I would say I had this, this ima imagination, even hearing Ben Sidron talk about the hipsters. It's like, what it would be like in the early 20th century that if you had Coltrane and you had Ella Fitzgerald and you had Miles and all the great hip hop, I mean, jazz leaders, all together in a cohort from around the country, the very best, and they're given, they're all living in a dorm that has recording equipment, that has visual arts equipment available, and that has their own black box. What kind of art could happen? That's what's happened for First Wave. That's what the university has provided, this forum for the greatest hipsters to come together and create art that's on the very cutting edge. As we all know, hip hop, hip -hop art being the great global arts vehicle right now for youth around the country, around the world. So we have this group of, of these students that 
what does it mean? The, what does this mean? The representation with these students with the canon? They are the canon. They're going to be doing the, their dissertations and their MFAs and their research on their own histories, performing and developing their own pieces. It is a totally revolutionary experience in higher education, and the impact of this has already been global. So we're on our way. What's the next stage? We're on our way to create a uh, MFA in hip hop arts, theater, and performance and pedagogy, and we'll have. Uh, Students flock from around the world to come uh, to, to be part of this, this journey. So I always kind of think this lens of, you know, our students on the shoulders of the greats and never forgetting where they come from. And that I have, like, for me, a Sophia Snow is like an Ella Fitzgerald. And I have this, you know, uh, a Duke Ellington who's Dominique Ricks, who's this larger than life young man. He is large, about six foot four and 270. Uh, <laughs> but he's this young man that. His first semester at UW-Madison, uh, his parents' home was foreclosed in Baton Rouge. Their, all of their possessions were sent out to the sidewalk. They ended up having to live in a Roach Hotel in the worst neighborhood in Baton Rouge, and he used all of his financial aid for all four years to pay for the rent for that family to live in that hotel. And he just graduated in May uh, with a degree in sociology. He's gone back to his hometown to be a teacher in, um, in his school that he went to in high, in high school in, in Baton Rouge. And he's going on to law school in two years, and he will become the, uh, a future governor of Louisiana. He's, he's, guaranteed that, he's guaranteed that to us, and he's a good friend with Barbara Lawton, so she's been helping him along the way. So that's the kind of uh, the framework. But uh, before you know, I, I do a little a closing, we're going to do a, a little piece here, but just this idea of the risk on these students, and I think I'm going to retract that because there's no, there's, there was no risk at all. And when you have that kind of talent and that kind of genius and that kind of commitment, the risk actually, when I think about it, the risk is on the side of the students for the willingness to come to Wisconsin and have to deal with all the issues that we have. As you can just read in their Race for Equity report and the disparities and everything that the director of the YWCA just had mentioned about you know, the disparities that exist in the achievement gap. You know, they're coming to us, it's, a, it's an honor for them to be here. It's not a risk whatsoever. And so you know, it, it has been an honor to work with these young great leaders, and they are the future uh, leaders of the YWCAs. Right? They're the future leaders um, of, uh, or deans and chancellors of universities. Uh, and the one person that I want to dedicate this final piece to is um, Nina Simone. Um, in fact, one of our artists this, this year just did a whole um, piece on Nina Simone dedicating it to Richard Davis's NEA award. Um, but one of my fiercest fighters in our program who's overcome so many things with her life uh, from Columbus, Ohio, who's transcended every kind of hurdle that you can imagine, um, almost you know, raising her family from here, being so far, far away. Amazing student, great scholar. I give the tribute to Nina Simone in the words of Shamika Moore. So let's welcome her to stage. So um, when I got to campus, the first joke that I heard, and I'm sure you've all heard it before, was there's only two seasons in Wisconsin, winter and construction. <laughs> and that's very true. So during this last past, um, blizzard that we had nationally, Twitter hashtagged it okay to see whiteness. These are some of the tweets that were in my drafts. So white outside, January gentrified the sun with tanning salons and called it summer renewal. So white outside, winter has lumped all other seasons in one category, weather of color. So white outside, Miley Cyrus wants no part in it but takes advantage of it at her convenience, so white outside it's never, ever seen color, but believes every snowflake is drastically different, so white outside it's never been to Africa, but aspires to go there and cool off the uncivilized, so white outside the wind asks me how I've gotten to this school. Aren't I a summer baby? It really means to say black, so white outside, it's still pissed Rodney died in the summer. Why not?
Cuffing season, I mean the snow stands its ground best on black boys, so white outside the wind has called me out my name five times already. So white outside, winter has infiltrated the minds of other seasons that look just like me, and they think I'm kinda cute for a summer baby. So white outside, the clouds are bleaching cream to us. The wise pray for the sun. The converted thank God for its absence. So why outside it's got me a bit self-conscious on whether I should call this a poem or urban art. So why outside the wind tried to seasonally freeze me into graffiti to look cultural. So why outside nooses in the 1940s start feeling like scarves here. You don't like it, but you do what you have to to stay alive. So why outside I don't want my sister to visit. I don't want her to catch the cold. So why outside it makes me not want to write anymore? Because everything I write about is what I see. So why outside it rarely sees me? It rarely notices itself. Or well, the frostbite it leaves for seasons of color to warm on its time. So why outside I am no threat to the wind's rich father. To him I am only here to be blown away. So, so why outside I wonder about the construction. They said there would be construction. Thank you.